particular section by saying, I'm going to talk about economic growth now. Um, but is the title of the book, after all, is an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. If that isn't economic growth, I don't know what is. Um, people have also argued that Smith is irrelevant because he's before the Industrial Revolution. Well, as we saw that the first economic growth happened in Holland in 1650, Smith saw that. Smith actually studies Holland. So that's actually very, he's, he's, he's very pertinent to the discussion. He's also seeing the second agricultural revolution, and he's predating and predicting what's going to happen in the Industrial Revolution. And his main um, arguments for what causes economic growth are the division of labor, uh, markets being larger, uh, geography and urban rural development, as well as actually interestingly interest rates, which is something very modern and something that we'll see in our very our mathematical models. So I'll just go through this relatively quickly. Um, the more uh, specialized labor is, the better you are at it, less downtime, more innovation, uh, more developed societies have more divided labor. Um, the larger the population, the larger the market. If I'm a these small villages, there may be one doctor among 100 villages that goes around <clears throat> and does everything, but you go to New York City, you know, how many plastic surgeons are there? Thousands. Um, you can get very specialized people that are much more productive in their particular areas that you can't have without a massive market. Um, Smith also goes talk about the development of England and the importance of rivers, that rivers lower transportation costs and cities will develop along rivers. Um, he believes that agricultural um, improvements have to happen first in order to support, uh, in order to support a larger population. And then wealth, which he calls wealth, uh, accumulates in towns, and then that sort of slowly trickles out to the urban world. That's his model of wealth based on growth. He does something very interesting, which I'm actually going to pause and we're going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, he looks at interest rates, uh, which was unheard of. And he looks at the relationship between what happened to the interest rate and what happened to the wealth formation. So in England, the interest rate fell from 10% to 25%. He notices that the wealth formation increases, the wages increase, and the rate increases. That's good. Uh, Scotland, the interest rate is much higher. He's using interest rate as a measure for what he calls the profits of stock. Basically, how productive is my investment? Well, Scotland's not as well developed, so we hope it's a little higher. Uh, Scotland is very poor, has low wages, and very slow rate of growth. Uh, France, who knows what the interest rate is? It's, it's wobbly. Um, the wobbly between England and Scotland, and it's not really growing particularly well. In fact, uh, one merchant for instance says it's going backwards. Um, he looks at Holland, which at the time was the wealthiest nation on earth. Uh, the interest rate is extremely low, it's only almost 2%. Uh, very high wages, and everyone's lending. Uh, if you have any extra money, you lend it, which is kind of odd. Everyone's lending. But the overall profits of the company are falling. He's seeing Holland as sort of a late game, um, sort of almost approaching a steady state economy uh, type of growth. Uh, we'll get to that later. And the US breaks the rules. The US has a very high interest rate and very high wages and profits. But he's saying that's because it's unlanded, underdeveloped, and very highly productive. He doesn't call it the time on the five years of labor rate. Um, so this is just summarizing points for the Agricultural improvement, that means population growth, more division of labor, wages increase, um, interest rate falls. And this is perfectly consistent with the European. But what happened here? We saw in that chart, that's where he got it from. That's his name. So everything so far for explaining Europe well. Let's take a look at Simon Kuznets. Simon Kuznets mainly worked in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and he's the first person to really quantify what it means for a country. Um, so he just collects a, lot, a bunch of data. His book is exceedingly boring. It's this thick, talking about Danish timber industry. It's growing from 1950 to 1952. It's really dull. But he's, you know, it's the first, he's the first person to really get this data. Um, basically what he finds is that there's long sustained growth of GDP in Western countries. And when you look at the developing world, it's not constant. There's very little growth. And it's sort of all over the place. Now, things have gotten better since we wrote. Critics and Sullivan thought it was good, but we'll see what happens. Um, he notices that since Europe hasn't gotten any bigger, um, the growth mainly came from increasing in productivity, technology, that sort of thing. Um, also, there's a massive investment on education, and that technological advances happen in a few sectors, like uh, cars or planes, there are a whole bunch of, or the internet, there are a whole bunch of innovations right in that sector all at once. It's 
not a little bit here, a little bit there. Um, he also notices that the first um, technological advances are usually in prolonging life, so lowering infant mortality rates, um, increasing average age. So if we're able to increase GDP per capita and have more people at the same time, that's even more impressive. And that's what he finds. So this is just summarizing what we've seen. Um, population grows, and GDP grows, and capita grows. Um, and they sort of stabilize uh, to a sort of steady state, which we haven't really seen yet. Um, he also notices that developed countries have smaller agricultural sectors and larger manufacturing service sectors. Again, this is all pretty obvious. And wages between the sectors, it's something we normally assume in labor economics are the same. Now, let's look at the third approach to this, which is a capital formation model. This is what everybody uses here. So the econ club here uses today, IMF uses, the World Bank uses, and a lot of their policies are based on this. It's, they go to poor Latin American countries and say, hey, if you do this, 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 don't be mission no time. Yes? Isn't the IMF definitely in favor of doing a lot of developing countries? Yes, because <laughs> they do that, 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 and then nothing happens. Maybe they get a little richer. Maybe they get much more suffering. So let's talk about, we're going to see what's wrong with these two models. The Herod Belmar model is the first one. And this one actually dates back to the 1940s. Um, this one I can actually explain to you because it's that simplistic. Y dot is change in wealth is equal to savings rate times how productive your stuff is minus how much it costs to maintain your stuff. <laughs> That's it. That's the model. Needless to say, if you try to plug in values and expect results, that's, I mean, here's the thing. Where's government? Where's education? Where's healthcare? Where's whether or not you're your natural endowment of resources? Where are your legal codes in that equation? <laughs> Arguably, those things also play a role in economic growth. But, I don't think, yes. I'm assuming those variables are allowed to be functions. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I am I'm lampooning it a little bit, but the main, the main problem, and we'll see this in, my, in our critique later on, is that it's solely dependent upon savings and productivity and capital. It doesn't factor in things that might, that, that either are independent of productivity and capital, or, as Kuzmitz will argue, just by crunching some number for modern productivity and capital, you're missing a lot of stuff. Or a country may be actually developing and the number goes down. I'm not going to go through the math of the solo model. But here's basic, he, he puts in much more complicated functions, much more complicated variables. And he basically concludes that the important things to look at are the ratio of capital per worker, which he holds as constant. Uh, the number of workers in a factory per machine is the same, which is not true. Um, and he looks at basically the only driving forces in these equations are um, technological progress and population growth. In your, in, he, uh, he's, he thinks that people will converge to some sort of steady state here, and that once the steady state, those are the only two things that are going to, um, going to uh, facilitate growth. Uh, you can't really see it here, but if you start out with a very low amount of capital, the amount of, well, actually you can't see it, um, the initial growth will be much faster, and then as, as the economy develops, it becomes slower and slower and slower. So this model would say, Underdeveloped countries are going to go really fast, really quick, and they're going to catch up pretty soon to us. Because we're going to be going sort of sliding down this curve, we're going to be going up this curve, and we're going to be at A, and we're all going to be happy and equal. This is it. So here are the important uh, consequences of the solo model. So we're going to all going to converge to some steady state. Uh, poor countries will grow faster. Um, once we get to steady state, technology and population, the only things that are going to drive growth. However, this doesn't seem to be happening. And some people are arguing, um, see this backwards arrow, that's actually going nowhere. And then that we're moving away from the steady state. So where are we going? Who knows? Because uh, this wasn't around when Solo made his model, but he did criticize the Harry Gilmore model relentlessly. Uh, true capital formation is associated with income per capita. Uh, but there's very little difference. It's not like everybody in Nigeria does this, and everyone in the US does this, and they're radically different people. No, we have relatively similar behavior patterns when it comes to like, saving or consuming things, but there's a wide variety of differences. Um, so, are those few percentage points all the difference? Um, 